Next, from Dublin, members of the Irish Parliament, known as the Doyle, select a new Prime Minister. Their vote follows the mid-November resignation of Irish Prime Minister Albert Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds was unable to hold his coalition government together after a disagreement with his Labour coalition partners. This program runs one hour and 40 minutes. We now come to deal with items numbers one and two. Is the House ready to proceed with the business of number one nomination of Taoiseach? On Taoiseach. Ken Corlea, Tarragon, Gananimoy, Dalairn, and Chakta, Bertia Hearn, a Kappa Ganukteran, or Hishak. I move that Dalairn nominate Deputy Bertia Hearn for appointment by the President to be Taoiseach. Deputy Bert Bertia Hearn, although still only in his early 40s, has immense political experience and an outstanding record of public service. While as a deputy, he represents our capital city. He enjoys public respect and confidence throughout the country. Both he and I first became members of Dáil Éireann on the very same day. Both of us have been members of the Dáil since 1977. He was chief whip of the Fianna Fáil party and minister of state in the departments of the Taoiseach and defence in the year 1982. A long-serving member of Dublin Corporation he was a very distinguished Lord Mayor of Dublin in 1986 and 1987. As Minister for Labour in 1987 and Minister for Finance from 1991, he has played a key role in creating a better industrial relations climate and in resolving industrial conflicts that threatened our vital national services. He also helped to negotiate each of the three national programmes with the social partners and to create a national consensus on economic and social policy. This has been the cornerstone of economic recovery and national prosperity since 1987. Deputy Bertie Ahern played a pivotal role in the formation of the last two governments. He joined me as negotiator for a joint programme with the Progressive Democrats in 1989 and also took part in the review of that programme in October 1991. He led the Fianna Fáil delegation which negotiated the programme for a partnership government with the Labour Party in 1992. This is widely acknowledged to be an outstandingly successful government programme, the most ambitious and comprehensive programme ever. Deputy Ahern has been Minister for Finance for three years, a position which has been part of the preparatory experience of the last three Fianna Fáil Tishi, including myself. Deep experience in economic management is increasingly essential to the modern head of government. Since 1991, he has been able to manage the economy in accordance with the Maastricht Treaty guidelines, something achieved only by Luxembourg and Ireland. He also had to steer the country through a difficult international recession, through which Ireland almost alone was able to maintain positive economic growth. He also brought Ireland through several months of the currency crisis in very difficult conditions and succeeded in establishing, in establishing stable conditions for the Irish pound post devaluation, which allowed interest rates to tumble to their lowest level in 15 years. As we know, even the strongest currencies, such as the French franc, were not in the end able to withstand the huge speculative pressures. The outstanding government and the minister are handing over an economy in excellent shape and with glowing prospects for the remainder of this decade. It is reasonable to expect that at the end of their term of office, the new government will leave an economy in equally good shape that has made further strides forward towards and following the same path. As Minister for Finance, Deputy Bertie Ahern has succeeded in meeting or bettering his budgetary targets. This year, the current budget deficit has been completely eliminated for the first time in nearly three decades. 
In the last two years, confidence has been strong, with high economic growth of 5% or more, low inflation, an investment boom, and balance of trade and payments surpluses. Net employment has risen, and the numbers at work are now at their highest level for 40 years. And the central bank now project an extra 32,000 new jobs for 1994 alone. Earlier this year, Deputy Hearn chaired a major OECD conference on employment and unemployment, examining the structural causes and remedies of unemployment. As this is the biggest single problem facing this country, his deep involvement as a minister in this issue over several years will be a valuable asset. Over his three budgets, he has further reduced the personal tax burden and undertaken significant tax reform. This year's tax measures gave reliefs to the mainstream taxpayer, costing in excess of £300 million in a full year. It also made provision for alleviating PRSI and lower paid jobs. It is very obvious that further progress can be made on that in next year's budget without prejudicing the integrity of the Social Insurance Fund. As a minister since 1987, Deputy Ahern has had considerable European experience, chairing the Council of Labour Ministers during the 1990 European Presidency. He accompanied me to the European Council at Edinburgh and has been involved in negotiating and directing the formulation of the six-year National Development Plan, which involves public and private investment in excess of £18 billion. This process will have brought him into direct contact with the needs of all regions of this country. The results will become very visible over the next few years, and it will be the incoming government's duty to put that plan into effect. Deputy Hearn has recently been appointed by me to the Fianna Fáil delegation at the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation. He is determined to give the same commitment and priority to the peace process as I have done. Deputy Ahern will represent a new generation of leadership in Ireland. He has proved himself to be an exceptionally effective negotiator and conciliator. If not now, then later, these qualities and skills would be helpful in consolidating peace and establishing confidence in both the unionist and nationalist communities on the road to a new northern settlement. These qualities and skills would be valuable in managing the economy and maintaining social consensus. Deputy Bertie Ahern is a deeply caring and compassionate man. He represents a constituency, Dublin Central, where he has had first-hand experience of some of our deeper social problems and where he has worked very hard to improve conditions and facilities at both a personal and community level. The trust he enjoys amongst his constituents is eloquent testimony to a person who is fully in touch with the problems of modern Ireland. For all these reasons, I consider that Deputy Bertie Ahern to be an extremely well-qualified candidate to be my successor for the position of Taoiseach and to lead Ireland towards the 21st century. I have been privileged to have led one of the most successful governments in the history of the state. It matters not now how long one occupies any position in political life, but what one achieves while in that position. On the first anniversary of the Downing Street Declaration, I hand over to my successor, an Ireland at peace with itself, with its people now enjoying rising standards of living, employment at its highest level for over 40 years, and an economy growing at the highest rate in Europe, and a budget surplus for the first time in nearly 30 years. I have made my contribution to our overall national advancement. It is hard to recall any occasion when an outgoing Taoiseach and government has handed over to his successor such a favourable situation.
Tarran Tiak Dahi MacAndrew. My uh, great privilege and honour and pleasure to formally second uh, the nomination of Deputy Bertie O'Hearn as Taoiseach. And that I do. Thank you, Cian Corla. Cian Corla, I move that Dáil Éireann nominate Deputy John Bruton for appointment by the President to be Taoiseach. I have profound pleasure in putting forward the name of John Bruton as Taoiseach and leader of the next government. At the very centre of his political character, there has always resided the principle of accountability. Long before it became necessary to name it as a political essential, he espoused it. He has believed always in the direct accountability of the Dáil to the people. He has held as fundamental to the running of this country that individual ministers and the government as a whole should be accountable to the Dáil and the people. Neither of these seemingly unarguable requirements have been much honoured in recent times. The chain of responsibility which this belief creates has been forged in John Bruton's mind through long experience in this House of 25 years. This includes membership of governments going back through a period of time under five Tishi. And as a working public representative, his practical knowledge spans 10 different administrations. John Bruton has been the dominant, persistent advocate of Oireachtas reform, and he is responsible for initiating the proposals for the committee system now in place in this Oireachtas. He is responsible for the introduction of television and radio in the Dáil. It has been the availability of this television and media coverage that has allowed the people to fully comprehend what we have just seen in this crisis we have gone through in this country. They were able to see and hear for themselves the unfolding of events in all their naked awfulness. The people have become re-engaged in the democratic system and it is important that we here in this House take note of this involvement. In reflecting on what this country has witnessed over the last few weeks, I'm reminded of a quotation from a book entitled The Democratic Revolution by US writer Larry J. Diamond. Democracy cannot triumph or even survive under the actions of a few brave leaders. Democracy requires an educated and active mass base, alert to the dangers of hero worship, conscious of the perpetual need to replenish the ranks of political leaders and poised to return to the ranks of ordinary citizens any who would abuse or aggrandize their political power. Here in this House, we would all do well to reflect on this salutary message. John Bruton's outstanding qualities of honesty, integrity, his idealism and patriotism in putting forward innovative ideas have formed a common thread in all assessments of John Bruton. John Bruton is not an image-driven politician. A government led by someone who is more concerned about the promotion of their own image than the operation of the team to the advantage of all team members will not work well. It is widely recognised that the best coalition was the one led by the most self-effacing Taoiseach we had in recent years, Liam Cosgrave. In terms of working as a coalition, it went through its full term and agreed on the dissolution of the Dáil. Everything was done in a common way and for the common good. John rises as a phoenix from the distressful ashes of the government which treated... Which treated which treated, which treated truth, perhaps you'd listen, gentlemen and ladies, which treated truth and accountability as of small importance and betrayed the trust of people and of this House in the paramount need for honourable and honest dealings with all issues. Without this, 
the democratic process is destroyed. Restoring trust is never easy. But I am confident that John Bruton will lead a government in partnership with the leader of the Labour Party, Dick Spring, which will deliver to the country, to the people and to this House the deputy, without interruption. conditions of excellent, excellence in the management of the nation's affairs, for which the painful experiences of the recent past have so abundantly demonstrated the need. People are conscious, Akian Korla, that discussions are still continuing. I have every confidence that John Bruton will emerge from this debate today as Taoiseach of this country to lead a government to restore people's faith in our democracy. And as I say, I have profound pleasure in putting forward his name as Taoiseach of this country. Deputy, Deputy Paddy Hart. Akin Korla, it's with a sense of pride and honour and great pleasure that I second the nomination of John Bruton. The, serving as the longest member of the Fine Gael party, I remember John Bruton being elected in 1969, too young to vote for himself and indisposed on the day of an election because he was in hospital. He was appointed a member of the front bench, bench uh, Fine Gael front bench in 1970. He has served in many cabinet posts. He was elected leader of Fine Gael in 1990. And he's going to prove to be one of the outstanding Tisha uh, of this country. I might add for the younger generation that as a student, John Bruton identified himself with the movement. Uh, aptly named by the late James D Dillon, leader of the Fine Gael party, as the Fine Gael Young Tigers. John Bruton, in his student days, wanted to change Fine Gael. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I can call it, perhaps I can call it people like Deputy Cowan, which would show some respect this morning. Tunis. Deputy Hart, without interruption. A little, a little dignity on a little dignity on an occasion like this might be befitting the Fianna Fáil party. Might I? <laughs> might I? Might I conclude my remarks at Kincorla by saying that it is indeed an honour for me to second the nomination, or formally second the nomination of John Britton. I may ask, firstly, uh, are there any further nominations? There are no further nominations. Deputy Dixby. <laughs> Spring, uh, on, on the basis of the agreement negotiated between the Fine Gael Labour and Democratic Left parties over the last number of days, uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party will be supporting the nomination of Deputy John Bruton for Taoiseach here today. As has been said, the economy is in a strong position. That success has been achieved on the basis of the programme for government negotiated and implemented between the Fianna Fáil and Labour parties since January of 1993, and indeed it will be, continue to be implemented in the future. It's of major importance to build on the present situation as has been outlined by the Acting Taoiseach Deputy Reynolds. I believe that the programme negotiated over the last number of days offers the prospect to build on the present strong situation. The two main challenges facing this country at the present time to continue to tackle the problems of unemployment and also to continue to build on the peace process in relation to Northern Ireland. These are the two main challenges. I believe they are the pillars of the programme that has been negotiated between the parties over the last number of days. And on the basis of those cornerstones and on the basis of that programme, the Parliamentary Labour Party will be supporting Deputy Bruton to form the next government. Deputy Prince Rossa. Mother Corlia. 
Dem Democratic Left is supporting the nom nomination of Deputy John Bruton for the position of Taoiseach. De Deputy Bruton and I come from very different backgrounds, political and otherwise. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that statements of facts are a, a joke for Fianna Fáil party. <laughs> over, the years, over the years, there have been many issues on which we have just dis disagreed. But he is a man who I hold in the highest respect. During our ye recent years in opposition together, I have come to know him better, and I believe that he is a fair and an honest man. And one of the absolute priorities for us now in the aftermath of these shameful events which surrounded the collapse of the outgoing government <coughs> is to restore the sense of honesty that should be an automatic characteristic of any government. I particularly admire the innovative thinking he has shown in regard to Northern Ireland and his willingness to move beyond the shibboleths of the past. Clearly, the continuation of the whole Northern Ireland peace process must be a priority for the government that is elected here today. And I have every confidence that John Bruton can build upon the progress that has been made to date. During the past number of days, the Democratic Left has been involved in the most detailed and thorough discussions with Fine Gael and Labour on a government programme of renewal. It is a good programme and it is a courageous programme and indeed an innovative programme. It is a programme which when fully implemented will result in a considerable improvement in the living con conditions and standards and social conditions of those on low pay, those who have no work and indeed uh, the, those who work uh, and are in the tax net at present. It is a programme capable of restoring the integrity of the democratic system and putting trust back into the relationship between the public and their democratic representatives. I was particularly gratified that it was not just approved, uh, approved at my party's special delegate conference last night, but that it was so decisively endorsed <coughs> by my party. For this programme to be successfully implemented, there must also be a sense of trust between the government parties. Good government requires not just a good programme, but also parity of esteem and respect between all the parties. Trust is as important at the beginning of a government as it is at the end of a government. The message I got from my party members at my conference last night was that we should go into government on the basis of the programme we negotiated. But they made it clear that nobody was entitled or should take our party for granted and I intend to ensure their wishes in this respect are honoured. Thank you. Deputy Mary Harney. Thank you, um, I won't be making a nomination for Taoiseach on this occasion, <coughs> but um, I will be talking about the nominations before the House. Can I first of all say that uh, there have been extraordinary events over the last few weeks in terms of this House, public accountability, transparency and all of the issues that arose where the public made up their own minds. But those extraordinary events haven't ended. We're still seeing some extraordinary events. And I have to say, I believe the Democratic left are being treated very shabbily because I attended a meeting last week of all party leaders involved in the preliminary talks and it was the clear understanding at that meeting that whichever smaller party entered into the negotiations that they were doing so on the basis of two seats at Cabinet. And that may, seem an, that may seem an impossible demand, but no party is represented at Cabinet if they've only one minister. Uh, with all of the international demands by virtue of our EU membership, ministers are frequently away. Uh, is somebody suggesting that if a party's minister is away, the party should have no clout, no voice uh, at Cabinet? That would be an impossible position to put any party in. Um, I have to say, I think we've arrived at the situation today, not through anything that could have been unforeseen, but through a combination of incompetence and arrogance. And that's why we're still in this period of, of uncertainty. They are strange times. The Labour Party are going from demonising John Bruton up to 10 days ago to virtually canonising him today. <laughs> if, if somebody told me 
that a few months ago that it would be a county Meath farmer that would bring democratic left into their first government, I would have said, bring the men in the white coats to see me. <laughs> I don't know if Deputy Rabbit is going to get the farm and all, but, <clears throat> but certainly, certainly they are extraordinary events. And I don't want to use today to talk about my experience over the last week, except to say this. A lot of people were sensitive about the way they were treated recently. A lot of people rightly demanded openness and transparency. I like to sit at a table and for people to tell me if they've got problems in dealing with my party. But when they tell me the opposite, and their colleagues brief the media day in, day out, I didn't see much openness or transparency there. And openness and transparency is not just something for others. We must have the bottle to be able to state our case and we must give people the opportunity to be able to argue their point of view. The Progressive Democrats approached the events over the last few, day, few days in an open and honest fashion. We were interested in being in government. Anybody in this House that is not interested in being in government doesn't deserve to be here because it's really only in government that you can implement your policies. We approached the talks in an open fashion and we stated our case to both the leader of the Labour Party and to the leader of Fine Gael. We put forward our views on economic issues and I think we put forward very reasonable positions which I intend to publish after today's debate. We stated our clear message on the economy which is fundamental to the formation of any government. We believe that tax reform is crucial if we are to generate employment in this economy. The average industrial job costs an employer £291 a week. The employee takes home £173, 40% of the cost goes to the government in tax and PRSI. That is a crazy tax, <coughs> excuse me, that is a crazy tax system for a country with our level of, of unemployment. And that's why the Progressive Democrats have always said that tax reform has to be the priority. And tax reform can't come as some re residual when you've done everything else. It must be fundamental to the new programme. In relation to public spending, we said that spending should approximate to inflation. We believe that the country must begin to live within its means if we're not to throw away all the benefits from economic growth. We all know the high cost of this economy because of the mad spending of the past. 70% of income tax in this country today goes to service our national debt. Given the growth rate for next year, the government will take in one billion extra pounds in tax. If we increase spending at the level of inflation, and if we take the extra £150 million to service the national debt, that would have been £400 million. There would have been £600 million left to deal with tax reform. It would have been the single biggest message to the unemployed and to the business people that we are serious about trying to deal with our economic and, uh, and unemployment uh, obstacles in this economy. Why should a business person in Dundalk be put at such a huge disadvantage because of our anti-work tax laws to his colleague a few miles up the road in Newry. And if the peace process means anything, it means that we must begin to harmonise in relation to taxation too, or we are going to lose heavily to Northern Ireland. <coughs> On state enterprise, I found the attitude, particularly of the Labour Party, quite astonishing. Um, the Progressive Democrats believe that every state enterprise must be approached in an open fashion in relation to its future. The rights of the workers, the rights of the consumers, the rights of the employees, all of these must be put in the balance. And there are, uh, of course, because of the changes by virtue of our EU membership, there are requirements on us anyway uh, to, to liberalise the markets. We must be responsive to the markets and we must seek to have efficient state companies. And we can't simply adopt the approach the taxpayers' money must be thrown at every problem. That's the politics that has got this country into the serious situation it's had, and it doesn't get you one single extra vote at the end of the day. That's my prediction. And I don't know if anybody could justify putting £60 million into Irish steel and not know, even at the end, whether it could be viable or not. I, I, I have to say, 
I have to say, I have to say in relation to, a lot of reference was made to the Maastricht guidelines and I say to myself, thank God for Maastricht, at least that places some control on us when we're not capable of controlling ourselves. But the attitude to fundamental economic issues in this programme published last night is a total fudge. No commitments are given, intentions are stated. No commitments, intentions. There's an intention to increase spending at 2% above the rate of inflation. That's merely the intention, it's not even a commitment. Next year's spending is to rise by 6%, uh, which is two, over two and a half times the rate of inflation. That is not justifiable and that is not necessary and that, that will not reinvigorate uh, this economy. These are among the issues that we put forward in the context of the preliminary talks. The choice as to which partner was involved in the negotiations was a choice for Fine Gael and Labour. And it's a choice that they made apparently sometime late on Saturday evening. Uh, I regret the choice. Uh, I regret the choice very much because I think the programme that's published is not the kind of coherent economic programme that we need in this country at this time. Yes, we have to create a fairer society. We have to give those that are unemployed the opportunity of participating in our economy. We cannot say to somebody that's unemployed, we will pay you social welfare so that you do nothing, but we won't give you the right to participate in a meaningful way in the development of this country. And my party put forward the kind of proposals advocated recently by Rory Quinn, but apparently they're not even acceptable to the Labour Party either. I don't think it's fair to say to so many people around the country that until we can create jobs, you're going to have to stay at home and do nothing and all we're going to do for you is merely pay you social welfare. There is an opportunity to have a radical community employment scheme in this country so that every person has the dignity and the possibility of going about uh, helping to develop their community and their country and not being sidelined and marginalised as they are at the moment. I heard some people from uh, a conference last night, I think, to talk about the bright new rainbow of renewal. Um, it's a bit more, to me, it would seem, the, the red rainbow of ruin uh, from a lot of the stuff that... that from, from a lot... From a lot... From a lot... From, from a lot of the stuff I've read. I think one of the classic fudges is the whole issue uh, to do with local charges. Some people take the view uh, that you're not entitled to pay for a service or that the community don't wish to pay for them. Uh, I believe that people are a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. If they go to the video shop, they don't expect the video for free. If they get services that are expensively provided by this state, they don't expect to get them for free. But we now have a situation where apparently there's going to be a tax allowance for the service charges, which means they're going to be extended, because any local authority that doesn't now have a service charge, if there's going to be a tax allowance, would want to be crazy. The service charges are going to be uh, extended, but if you haven't paid them already, apparently you needn't bother paying them, because nothing will happen to you. An amnesty in service charges. An, an amnesty... An amnesty... An amnesty in service... Well you, well, you can explain it. Let's debate your programme in here next week, if, if I'm misinterpreting it. I, if you send me a copy, I might have been able to read it last night. I had to rely... I had to rely on the morning papers. I had to rely on the morning papers. If I got a copy last night, I might have been able to... Give, may, it, more, may I, give it more time. May I just... I can't order, order. May I dissuade the member in procession from going into great detail at this time. I, can't call I respect, respectfully submit that rather long speeches should be left later in the day for the appointment of government, not at this stage. Can Corla, can Corla, it's hard to believe that people are out openness and transparency and making it all more relevant. If, if what I hear in the background, we shouldn't keep the president waiting. Uh, I'm supposed to sit down. Um, can I, can I say, Kian Corla, my party will be in opposition, obviously, if a new government is elected today, as we were after the last election. I want to say this to the new government, particularly in relation to Northern Ireland, that they will not find the Progressive Democrats on any occasion either playing politics with Northern Ireland or seeking to make life difficult for the government. I believe that a new government elected by John Bruton will be good for Northern Ireland 
And I think those people that are worried or concerned need have no worries or concerns. Because I had a lot of dealings over the last year uh, with John Bruton, particularly in relation to matters to do with Northern Ireland. And I found him to be genuine, interested, wanting to help, having an open mind. And I believe uh, that we need have no fears. But I want to assure uh, John Bruton and the new government that I will not engage in any party politics here in this floor or anywhere else in relation to that matter. It's far too important uh, and I hope that nobody else uh, does so either. On the 12th of January 1993, John Bruton said of the new government that was about to be elected that it was a government that did not have the moral authority that derives from a mandate from the people. I'd like to quote those words and say that the government that's about to be elected today does not have the moral authority that derives from a mandate from the people. And I want to give no further commitment, no further commitment, then, in I want to give no further, <laughs> I want to give no further commitment than Deputy Bruton gave in relation to what I will do in opposition, I want to quote. He says, there are different ways of doing things. There are better policies available than those cont contained in this programme. We will be using our strength in this House to ensure that alternative policies are put forward and that an alternative government to implement those policies is put in place at the earliest opportunity. And that's certainly what we will be doing. Today is a great day uh, for John Bruton. He's been demonised by many uh, in recent times. And for those that stood by him, it's easy to be on his side today, and maybe for the last few days. It perhaps wasn't so easy in recent times. It's a great day for him personally and for his family, and I want to wish him well. It's also a great day, I think, for the democratic left, if they're going to be participating in the government, and I presume they will because I'm sure they'll either be blink or chink later on. Um, if they're going to be participating in the government, it is a great day for them. They're a small party. It'll be their first opportunity to participate in government. And I know the great pride that we had in 1989 when we went into our first government. I know the sense of excitement, the sense of vision, the things you want to do. Um, and I believe that the democratic left will be hard-working, honourable members of that government because in my dealings with them, I have always found them to be honourable people. And if they make an agreement with you, uh, they stand by it and they're extremely hard-working. Um, I think we might miss Deputy Rabbit on the order of business. And perhaps the new government will give him an opportunity, if he's in it, to at least... Uh, the way things are looking, you want. <laughs> the reason... The, re the reason... The reason of four-party option um, was not a possibility is that neither of the small parties would have had the kind of political clout that people need if they're around a cabinet table. And that's not a threat to anybody, that's a, a, stating a obvious political reality. The only way we can have our policies implemented, the only way we can have our commitments in a programme for government honoured, is if we have political clout in terms of our numbers. And that's why a four-party government was never on. I regret that in particular Fine Gael, despite their strength, having 50% more seats than the Labour Party, did not exert their authority in relation to their choice of coalition partner. Because I believe many of their supporters are concerned about the new government that's about to be put in place. And I want to assure them that I'll be delighted to represent their interests in this House and to be vigorous in attacking the government and in making sure in particular on the fundamental economic questions that this country is not going to be driven to the left. I see the new leader, Fianna Fáil, wants to bring his party to the left. Uh, recently, a commentator said the centre of Irish politics was very crowded. After today, I'm going to be here in the centre all on my own, it seems. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, de if Deputy Ahern believes his party is too pro-business and he wants to move it to the left, um, I'll have a large political space all to myself. But I can assure you, I'm looking forward to the challenge, and I think it will be a challenge. I want to wish I'm, well, I can tell you after my dealings with you last week. <laughs> Count Porna, the Progressive Democrats will be opposing uh, the, the nomination of Deputy Ahern, and because we do not support 
the nature of the government that Deputy Bruton proposes to put in place, we will not be supporting his nomination either. Deputy Trevor Sergeant. Robert Kim Corlett. Um, I'd like to say. May I again intervene like to, to say, say I wish to dissuade members I, for making rather long speeches and going into detail at this stage. They would be more appropriate. Absolutely. They would be more appropriate when we come to deal with the nomination of government. Absolutely. Stay. And having not having had an opportunity receiving this only a couple of minutes before the doll, the government for the government of renewal programme, it certainly wouldn't be appropriate to make any type of long speech. So I'll desist from that. But I do want to say that it is a very bizarre day we find ourselves here with. We're expected to vote for a Taoiseach without any idea about what type of cabinet will be in that government. And as such, it is a question of the blind leading the blind to some extent. But it is also very bizarre because of the day in which it occurs. Exactly one year ago, we celebrated the signing of the Downing Street Declaration. And it was one example of a number where the Green Party was in a position to offer support to the government. And it would, on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, be doing that um, as well in, in the forthcoming government. But it's also the same day that the British government played a wonderfully political trick by giving permission for the Thorpe plant to go ahead. And it seems that um, in here all was peace and harmony, whereas outside, particularly on the East Coast, there was another feeling altogether of, of, of fear and, um, and concern that the whole facts were not being put before us. And it seems that here as well, that Irish parties that we see here have been learning something of that trick of how to put the, pull the wool over people's eyes to an extent. Because on the one hand, uh, we had all hope of a three-way government, and on the other hand, I believe we had the agenda of a two-party government with the intention of trying to freeze out the smaller party. And I think we're beginning to see what was behind the scenes today. And it's interesting to hear Deputy Owen in, in uh, proposing Deputy Bruton as Taoiseach talk about avoiding hero worship and about insisting on renewing political leadership and at the same time we have the type of cult worship of, of, of uh, political leadership in this country and the lack of dealing with the wider political issues such as the double jobbing of the dual mandate which again is something that I believe parties are supporting here but are not prepared to come out and act upon. And like in so many areas, I feel that is one of the weaknesses that this government is carrying on from the last, uh, it seems, they are not prepared to act on their convictions. And to that extent, it's disappointing. May I finish, Account Corla, by, by, by saying that it, it is ironic that in spite of talking about um, avoiding hero, hero worship and um, the type of political patronage that is supposed to not be welcomed by a new government, it seems to be coming, to, coming apart on the issue of state cars and, and, and who's going to be, be in the back seats or the front seats of them. Uh, and I, I hope that the government will, will take on board the advice, which is plentiful and authoritative, from people who do not need to get elected, I grant you that, but they are out there. The Conference of Religions of Ireland, the ERSI, the European Commission are all recommending policies which have been proposed by the Green Party for years. And yet, when it comes to presenting them to parties here, they talk about, well, they don't have to get elected. Well, political courage is what is lacking rather than a political ideology here. And I think the government that takes office, whatever it is, needs to take that back on as part of its platform. The courage to make the changes necessary. And I could just simply say it in my last sentence, that it's a very unnatural rainbow that does not include the colour green. Gormagui. To be Tony Gregory. Gormagui, Ceann Corlea. Ceann Corlea, I wish to state my position on what is effectively a vote on the formation of a new government. For the present, at least, the Fianna Fáil party is, I believe, discredited. Consequently, it is difficult to see any practical or workable combination of parties 
the former government than the three which have negotiated the programme for a government of renewal, Fine Gael, DL and Labour. That is, I believe, the reality. I do not believe that any involvement by the Progressive Democrats would have led to stability. The obvious alternative could be a, a general election, which possibly would not significant, significantly have changed anything. Although many people have said to me that had there been a general election at this time, the result could have been a radical change in the voting preference of a substantial part of the electorate, such as their disquiet and, and even disgust at recent events. I welcome the involvement of the two left-wing parties in the formulation of the programme for government, and I look forward to a more committed approach to resolving the problems of poverty and disadvantaged communities throughout this country. I represent many disadvantaged people, and I trust that if there is a new government, that it will respond positively to their needs. There are major social problems of endemic unemployment, extreme educational inequality, homelessness, to the extent that as a society we are still very far from cherishing all the children of the nation equally. In fact, for a great number, the reverse is the case. This has led to a sense of hopelessness among many of our young people, the most vulnerable of whom are now further exploited by the activities of drug dealers. I intend to do all I can to influence any new government to confront these issues and create a more just and a more equal society. I also trust that the peace process will be enabled to regain its momentum and will not be hindered in any way. On this basis, Account Corlea, I do not intend to vote in a way that would prevent the formation of a coalition government here today. Johnny Fox. Thank you, Ken Corla. Um, Deputy Harney mentioned there that if a County Mead farmer were successful in leading a democratic left um, party into government, that they could send for the white coats. And I just said it might take the support of a County Wicklow farmer to keep them there, and maybe you should send for the white coats anyway. <laughs> it seems to me that um, I, like some other speakers, haven't had the opportunity. Uh, I haven't been afforded a copy of the programme that is before us. It, that probably is little unfortunate insofar as that our vote is more important than it was as independents in the House. I think I said on the formation of the last government there were a hundred deputies uh, and I was going to vote for what I thought was a positive and practical government. Uh, even though they didn't need my support at the time, but I did mention that it wouldn't always be the way in the House and so it has proved. Uh, but can I say that Looking at the positive side of the outgoing government, one has to say that the last two years has brought this economy and the nation as a whole forward uh, in, in immeasurable terms. And I think it is necessary to record that fact because irrespective of one's political hue, uh, the peace and stability and the economic life of this country is what every member is elected in this House to pursue. Uh, we have indeed a situation today that is, uh, is, is rather um, extraneous rather than bizarre, it might be the two of them, but certainly it is very, very difficult to understand how parties from uh, each political pole can come together uh, and serve the ethos on which they stand for and were elected to the House. Notwithstanding that, we are in a political crisis. It is an unfortunate and could prove uh, the downfall of the last government could prove to be something that time may prove to be, have, have had very little significance. We have to wait on the outcome of that. But the facts are now that the economy is in excellent shape. We have a position where we can go forward as far as the peace process is concerned, and things generally are looking up for the people of this country. I don't want in any shape or form as, as one uh, independent deputy to set that back. But I do feel that some of the rumours, and they're only rumours that I have to hand, emanating from the programme for government, initiated by perhaps the people of the left, and I want to, uh, also to say I have no difficulty with the personalities involved in the parties of the left, but the programme of the left 
will, I believe, if implemented as we understand it, put this country into a rewind situation from which we cannot afford. The facts, just because we have an economy in good shape, is something that we don't have to squander. We have to build on it, because there are generations to come that will not thank us for handing away the family silverware at this time, just because it happens to be uh, a power uh, play situation. And to that end, uh, I intend to abstain on the vote for Taoiseach. Uh, the government of the day can count on my support issue by issue if that uh, programme happens to fit in with the thinking that I have. I hope that I'm a sound thinking person and that the economy and the people will come first rather than the politicians and the state cars. So I would like to wish well Mr Bruton and his family and his party and indeed all those parties uh, who intend to form the next government. Thank you, Cancola. Jerry Neil T. Blaney. Uh, Cancola, I'm sure everybody here hopes that this is the last speech before we make our decision. And I think it is my friend Tom is not feeling all that talkative this morning, so... <laughs> Could I just say as briefly, as briefly as it is possible for me to say anything, which many people don't think is very likely, but could I say in regard to the outgoing government that they have made a fair fist of things, even though there are many details that I would disagree with. That an incoming government, without question, as has been outlined by the Taoiseach here this morning, will be taking over uh, an economy that is in better shape. Now, I wouldn't boast about it. It's in better shape than it has been for a very long time. I would hope that that incoming government will not take advantage of the goodies in the cupboard and those that are yet to come to have a fling while they are in government and leave us in no better position or in a worse position when they cease to be government than we are at the moment. I believe that there are two outstanding items insofar as I am concerned, so far as this country is concerned indeed, and those are the creation of jobs for our people and it's not just the question of how many are on the register of unemployed today. We have failed far more abysmally than the numbers of 270 or 80,000 are concerned because to those we must add, and we never do, those who have had to leave the country because of the lack of jobs and our real under provision of work for our people is far greater than the register of unemployed. And this I would like to say to whoever is going to preside over the fortunes of this country in the immediate future, not just to be looking at the unemployed register, look at all those who are not here to be on the register and realise how abysmally we have performed in this country over many, many years and the rake's progress for 20 of the last 25 years. The second item that I'm concerned about, and very concerned about, is peace in this island. And I do hope, and I do expect, that regardless of what or who is in what position or ministry, that there will be no let-up on the seeking of peace in our country. But I would say and admonish very, very, very sincerely those who feel that we can have peace at any cost. Peace at any cost is merely pushing forward violence for the future. It's got to be a just peace. It's got to be a peace that strikes at the cause of our problems and not just the symptoms. And we're all so hyped up, and rightly so, with the breakthrough that has been made, that we tend to look around and make all sorts of compromises in order to continue the non-violence of today. But please remember that the cause is there and it is not being dealt with. 
and that cause can only be dealt with between the two governments. It's not a matter solely and only for the two communities. And there is the further aspect of the whole entire scene that I want to get this new government coming in to take real note of, and that is that we have 12 counties, not just six counties, that have suffered and been deprived ever since partition was installed, and that there are six south of the border as there are six north of the border, and of anything, the southern six apart from the violence, which of course is unspeakable at this stage, apart from the violence, the six counties on the southern rim of our border have been more deprived and longer deprived and ravaged by partition than the six northern for the simple reason that the six in the north were helped very much by the occupier Great Britain from Westminster, whereas the government, successive governments in this particular building here did not differentiate between the counties on the border and the counties elsewhere in the country. Having said that, may I say this, that the proposal of the Taoiseach of Bertie Ahern is one which naturally, I think on numbers alone, would commend themselves in any forum of this nature. His qualities and his experience, without question, would, on a personal basis, commend them for them. And that while I will vote for Bertie Ahern, that is, if you're going to have a vote, because the way I hear you talking here, you'd think it was a foregone conclusion. Perhaps it is. But then we thought that last week. We're not so sure this morning. <laughs> and last night. <laughs> and last night, yeah. I'll vote for Bertie Ahern, but in the event of Bertie Ahern being rejected, I will not oppose John Bruton. And I say this not only because of the fact that John is a long time here, but also because of the fact that when he came into this house, he was one of the bright, young, forward-thinking sparks of the Fine Gael benches. And God knows there wasn't very many of them at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps he has more than served, more than served his time should he come to the throne this morning and I would wish him well in that position and I don't envy him his problems in organizing, controlling and keeping in check his partners and the younger the partners and the smaller the child the more difficult they are to control. <laughs> But in any event, as I say, my first choice is Bertie Ahern. And I will not oppose John Bruton because I believe that John Bruton has the knowledge and the interests of rural Ireland at heart. He may not know the sort of little farmers that I represent, but he's had a fair opportunity to learn a bit about them. And if he needs any further advice on them and he's handling with them, Please don't hesitate to call on me, John. Thank you very much. I propose to proceed now with nominations for Tishar. And I'm putting the questions in the manner in which they were submitted to me. And the question now is the Dolairin nominates. Deputy Bertie Ahern for appointment by the President to be Taoiseach. The Aberdeen Tarishkina Aberdish Tha Inai Aberdish Neil Shirin Gwilin Tarishkin Bhutte. I think the motion is lost. Vote tall.
A tall, 85, kneel, 74, motion carried, and I hereby declare to be John Bruton to have been nominated by Dahl Aaron for appointment by Antisha. John Bruton. Count Corda, I wish to thank this house and my colleagues for electing me, for nominating me as Taoiseach. It's a high office, but a humbling one. It's a high office because the holder is rightly held responsible for the good governance of this republic. It's a humbling office because in our democracy the Taoiseach does not discharge his duties by virtue of his or her own merits or, dare I say it, by looking into his or her heart, but derives all authority from this assembly, the Dáil, the duly elected parliament of our people. I should reflect on the word Taoiseach. In Gaelic Ireland, a Taoiseach who was one who led by example rather than by exhortation, by character rather than coercion, and who exercised such authority as he had as a service to the people. In the same way that I seek simplicity in the office of Taoiseach, I seek simplicity in government and national policy. 
Good government is a public service and it should be kept simple. This is a republic. Public office is a privilege that must be paid for in hard work and long hours. The government must go about its work without excess or extravagance and as transparently as if it were working behind a pane of glass. The same holds for national policy. In recent times we've seen two views discarded. First that which said that the state should substitute for private effort and later that which said that there is no such thing as society. Both are wrong. The state must support, it must not substitute, otherwise it will end up enslaving. And there is such a thing as society. We are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. From that flows the simple aims of proper public policy. The first duty of a government is to keep good order, which means promoting peace. Normal life in Northern Ireland is now our first national aim. Then there are our own needs to be met, to nurse the sick, to house the homeless, and to give every man and woman a chance to contribute to the community. That contribution is the cornerstone of civil society. That being so, we can simply say that our work is to create work. That's at the heart of the joint programme agreed between Fine Gael, the Labour Party and the Democratic Left. I move that the Doyle sit later than 4.45pm today and should adjourn on the conclusion of item number two. The proceedings on the nomination of the government shall be brought to a conclusion not later than 7.30pm by one question which shall be put from the chair. That at the conclusion of business tonight the House shall adjourn forthwith until Tuesday the 24th of January 1995. That until the Doyle shall otherwise order the order in which questions to members of the government other than the Taoiseach shall be asked in accordance with Standing Order 35-2 shall be that in which the members of the government will be listed in a resolution approving their nomination by the Taoiseach for appointment by the President. It is now necessary, last count Corla, that I go and inform the President of my nomination so that she may appoint me. I would accordingly suggest that the Doyle be suspended for three and a half hours. Agat Hishig, Township Deputy Bertie O'Hearn. Last count call you, Mullum, John Bruton, Mar Hishig, Agusta Sulagum, Gomeg, Sail Sonagas and Fust, Neil, on Kiel, Kane, Labona, Nelehan to Shaw, Agusta V. Fado, Agusta Trace Liam Lesher, Ainos. Last count call you, I want to congratulate uh, Deputy John Bruton on his election as Taoiseach and to wish him well in the period ahead. Uh, my advice to John Bruton uh, this afternoon is uh, carpe diem, uh, enjoy the day, seize the hour. Uh, you've, I think, wrestled, it's fair to say, a great triumph from dark days. And you're entitled to feel that uh, the many years that, that you've put in as a, a diligent public representative, uh, that you've earned uh, what you've achieved. And this is your day in the sun. It's a great honour for you to become the 10th Taoiseach of this country, uh, following in the great line that began with W.T. Cosgrave and Eamon de Valera. It's a great honour for your wife, uh, Fanola, and your family, and everybody in the Fianna Fáil benches and in the Fianna Fáil organisations. Uh, through me uh, to you, Deputy Bruton, uh, conveys their congratulations to you and to them. It's also a great honour for your party and for your country. I think you're, you're the first Mead man to become Taoiseach. Uh, the Mead men have caused not a little trouble to Dublin men over the years. <laughs> I just want to promise you that, that as leader of Fianna Fáil, we'll, we'll give you a good, hard, fair match during your term as Taoiseach. And you can count on that 
as our counties always portray. Deputy John Bruton, last count, Corlea, has been a member of this House and an active member uh, for 25 years. Uh, he's already been Minister for Finance, Minister for the Public Service, Minister for Industry, Trade, Commerce, Tourism, as well as being a leader of the House. He's made an honourable and a distinguished contribution to the work of the House, not least in his pioneering efforts to uh, introduce a modern committee system to the House. When he published his ideas on Dáil reform back 14 years ago. I took a great interest in what he had to say and I have since supported some of his key concepts in that regard and had the privilege to work with him when he was in government on a previous occasion uh, to achieve some of those. His considerable experience in government and is, I think, as everybody will acknowledge, a leader of some stature. Uh, he's known more than most the ups and downs of politics. Uh, I know the feeling, John. Uh, ten days ago, uh, I went to an Ecofin Council in Brussels. I thought I could look forward to forming government with a little more than 24 hours to go. Uh, that programme was, to all intents and purposes, agreed. Uh, by that evening, I was contemplating the prospect of heading into opposition. Uh, now I've reached there. Uh, like his predecessor on this side of the House, he should reflect that it is the quality of what he achieves as Taoiseach that is important. Uh, not how long he manages to stay there. I think that will be a true uh, mark of success and of the contribution uh, to the welfare of the nation. Uh, the outgoing partnership government, last count Corlea, between Fianna Fáil and Labour has left him uh, holding a, an excellent hand, uh, a prospering economy, unprecedented levels of structural and cohesion funding negotiated with Europe to the end of the decade and the breakthrough in the peace process achieved a year ago today. It will be up to him to make the most of those advantages. We will provide constructive, vigorous and vigilant opposition. Indeed, I look forward to cooperating with him in the national interest as appropriate. We will not criticise him for carrying on good and successful policies. On all sides of the House, we wish to see our nation prosper and to go forward. And he as Taoiseach has our good wishes, he's entitled to our respect and he will get that while he is leader of our country. Governments last count Corlea are usually judged uh, by the people on their management of the economy unless controversy arises that overshadows its record of competence and focuses on other aspects of its governance. I am glad to state uh, here in the House today that the economy of the country, uh, organised and I think mastered by the outgoing government, all of us is in fine fettle. Together with the trade unions of the country, the employers and the farm organisations and other groups, uh, we have worked um, well and hard to reach a plateau of monetary stability and fiscal discipline. And not just because the Maastricht criteria demand it, that we ad adopt uh, strict yardsticks, but because those criteria express, I think, the real needs of the Irish economy. And they expect expressed the opinion of most of our electorates uh, that we must uh, keep our house in order. I just, last count, Coyle, want to mention uh, a few issues. Our GDP is forecast to grow by over 6% in real terms this year, and the gross national product will grow by 5.5%. Average inflation will be 25 as we said at budget time. And the budget will recover, I think, the first current account surplus uh, since the year of 1966-67. The debt GMP ratio should fall to about 94 per cent, in other words, five pints lower than at the outturn this time last year. And these striking figures show an economy in tip-top shape, and I trust it will remain so. I think we have to briefly remind ourselves of two very salient figures from the period of the last Fine Gael Labour coalition. Uh, when they entered government uh, back in 1982, the debt GDP ratio was just 93 per cent. When they left, it was 122 per cent, a 30 per cent increase. Uh, they receive it back now, again, uh, with 93 per cent. And, of course, we're committed that it must move down. Back in 86, we had over 300,000 workdays were lost in strikes. And last year, the figures were a mere one-fifth of that horror figure. And the record is there, I think, for us all to see last count for you. And later on today in the election, a government, which is more appropriate uh, as our precedents, uh, show 
uh, I will set out the record of the outgoing government partner. And that will, I think, last count Corlea, be seen as a good record in the main. A record of planning for change and implementing change. A record of sound financial management and innovative strategies uh, for business. We had, I think, over and handed over an economy that is powering ahead and uh, creating jobs uh, now at a very satisfactory rate. It was difficult to achieve that for a time, but now it's certainly satisfactory. We hand over the nation's finances in better shape than has been at any time for 30 years. We leave in place a decade of consensus national agreements, which have been the foundation stone of sanity in industrial relations. Uh, the sound management, last count, Corlea, of structural funds and cohesion funds uh, destined to transform our infrastructure is vital to ensure uh, maximum gain now and in the future. There's major decisions that have to be made with regard to the future of our semi-state companies and on the accessibility of our public institutions. I commend most strongly to uh, Deputy John Bruton and his government that they hand back the economy to us uh, in 1997, if not before, in as good a shape as we have left it for them now. If they attempt to stray from the paths of righteousness in economic terms, <laughs> we will hound and harry them as we see fit and persuade them and persuade them Mr. Please. and persuade them as best we can to do what is right for the economy and right for the long prosperity of the nation. On this, the front first anniversary last count, Corlea, of the Downing Street Declaration, I want to just make a special mention today of the outgoing Taoiseach Albert Reynolds and his historic achievement uh, with others in brokering a peace in Northern Ireland. I have on many occasions called him, in the words of Daniel O'Connell, the best of patriots. None of us who enter politics knows what, if anything great, we will achieve when we come in. And I think it was in destiny's hands that Albert Reynolds' greatest legacy to his country was peace. Uh, no more war in our country. No more war this Christmas, last count, Corlea. Uh, who, who could have believed that uh, just over a year ago? There were those who believed, and there were those who continued to hope that there were brave hearts and that risked much uh, for us all, last count, Corlea. Albert Reynolds was among those risk takers, those believers, those best of patri patriots, and we are as a nation indebted to him. The traumatic events of recent times will not, in the long term, last count, Corlea, I believe, overshadow his outstanding achievements as a good Taoiseach, a honourable politician and a good man. Here, here. Here, here. I extend my own thanks and the thanks of our party to his wife Kathleen and to his family for allowing him the space and time to work for this nation. On behalf of the Fianna Fáil party, last count, Corlea, I want to say in conclusion that we will cooperate in the smooth running of the House, as we've already done this morning in clearing business, to do all in our power to ensure that the work of governments uh, and this government and this new government uh, proceeds apace. We wish Deputy Bruton and your coalition partners, whoever they may be, well in the days to come. Uh, those of us on the opposition side of the House will be uh, watching you uh, very closely. Uh, we will uh, agree to uh, the motions put forward and to the arrangements uh, we would like that are quick. I would be consulted in these matters. Uh, Deputy Bruton would, of course, I'm sure, uh, know that my colleagues on this side of the House would be very glad if the earliest opportunities uh, we could know before we make our speech on the formation of government, uh, the unusual circumstances that we don't know what uh, political parties, we normally never know the individuals, but at this stage we don't even know the political parties. Uh, but I promise myself, Deputy Bruton, that in congratulating you as Taoiseach I will not, as on other occasions, uh, say uh, any hard things, so I will not. Perhaps, but I could just quietly and mildly say just a few lines uh, from two famous poets. Uh, Wordsworth, who said once that the rainbow comes and goes, and Shelley, who said that when the cloud is scattered, the rainbow's glory is shed. We would like to know what the real circumstances are. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Dick Spring. On behalf of the Parliamentary Labour Party, 
I would like to congratulate Deputy John Bruton on being elected, uh, nominated as Taoiseach, and I congratulate both him and his family. Deputy Bruton has served in this House, as has been said by many, for many years, and I think he has given his life, all his working life, to politics and to the betterment of this country. I congratulate him on the achievement of this office, and I look forward to working with him in the government that's going to be formed this afternoon. I'd like to compliment the leader of the Fianna Fáil party for that speech. It promises a speech of constructive opposition. I think this country needs both constructive opposition, a constructive government and constructive opposition. He did quote some of the facts and the figures from the 1980s. He complained about the government, but I think if we're going to open that debate later today, we may also have a lot to say about the opposition and the quality of, of opposition in the mid-80s. I, I wish Deputy Hearn well in his task in leading the largest party in the state, a party with a proud history in the state, and I know that he will do that because he is, a, he is a man of conviction and a man of courage and a man who has enormous political experience uh, in, his, in his career. Again, I congratulate Deputy Bruton. I wish him well. He's taking on a difficult task. It's never an easy task. And I look forward to working with him in that task. Uh, thank you, Deputy Spring. Deputy Mary Harney. Uh, last count, Corla. Um, the greatest honour that this House can bestow on any of its members is the honour of electing them to the position of Taoiseach and that honour has now been bestowed on John Bruton and it is a great day for him. Uh, he certainly is a fighter and anybody that wants to do a study of political what happens in politics just has to look at the careers of Albert Reynolds and John Bruton over the last five weeks to realise that politics is the art of the possible, that virtually nothing is impossible. And my only advice to John Bruton is that he's now been elected Taoiseach. I hope that he's firm and decisive. There's been a lot of uncertainty and indecision in recent times. But he still has the major task of putting a government together. And we're in a very unreal situation where we don't know uh, what parties are going to make up that government or if that government is going to have a working majority in this House. I must say I'm delighted the Constitution limits the number of appointments to 15. Um, so in that, there are no choices that... Uh, the, the various parties can make or extensions that can be made to that. Uh, but I want to wish John Bruton well in the task that's ahead of him. Um, I, I am sure that he will operate that government uh, on the basis of the trust he's spoken about so much and certainly for my dealings with him uh, during the past year uh, I've always been able to work well and it's always been on the basis of trust and cooperation. Um, I want to congratulate his wife Fanula and his family whom I see here today. It's a great day for them too. And I genuinely wish them well. And can I also wish uh, Albert Reynolds well? He's standing down today, today as Taoiseach. And I want to wish him and his wife Kathleen and his family well as well too. Thank you, Deputy Harney. Deputy Francis de Rossa. Morgan Lask, um, I, I, <clears throat> I simply want to congratulate uh, Deputy John Bruton on achie achieving uh, what is the, 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 the highest honour that this House can bestow on anybody, and that is to lead the government of this country. Uh, I, I have already put on record here this morning uh, my regard and respect for John uh, Bruton and his abilities. Um, I certainly will be supporting John Bruton on the basis of the programme and to implement the programme that I have had a part in negotiating over the last number of days. Um, I too would uh, like to uh, uh, say that I appreciate the um, situation that the outgoing teacher find, finds himself in and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not always e easy to, um, to hand up or to hand over a position of uh, such high office and uh, th there is no doubt, uh, as I have said before, that one of the most important ach achievements of, of Albert Reynolds is the peace process and insofar as I have any par hand actor part in that process I will seek to ensure that it is successful. Thank you. Uh, thank you Deputy. Deputy Trevor Sargent. Well, Margaret Alaska and Carla. If son and uh, the Green Party, Trace Liam, then Deputy John Bruton. August um, Bavan Caelan Fanola, August a clown oak, Austin Post Tavatoch, um a top winter mock again. August Credum Gordina Maconta a Vian Safrasura, Agus Taisagum, Agus Osulagum, Gamarshin, Alanixhe, so it's a real to Snua. Um, honesty is a, a quality which is fundamental to politics, but I think it's particularly important that it is, at times rises above populism and what is seen to be simply a popular decision. And that's important because otherwise the next generation, those who have not voted us in and who will not be able to vote us in, will, will, will be um, unable to benefit from the government of today. Uh, 
Deputy O'Hearn, uh, and I wish to pay tribute to him as well in the magnanimous way he, uh, he has uh, dealt with the, the times he, he has felt he's found himself in. Um, but I, I, he mentioned creating jobs, and Deputy Bruton mentioned creating work. And I, I assume that they are both um, similar in, in terms of, the, of what's been meant. But I would also like to say that it's something that hasn't been grasped by the other parties, that ecology and economics are rooted in the same word, and they have to be dealt with as part of the same ideology. And there's al already much work out there. Creating work is, is sometimes a misnomer. There is a lot of work out there, and I feel that we need to develop the ways that is going to make sure that work gets done and doesn't deny people the part to play in society that will give them part of that work. And I look forward to assessing each of the issues that come up from the Greens' point of view on the sustainability of each measure uh, and on the overall benefit it will be to society. And I will be voting in accordance with that principle. Tom Fox. And the second time round, Unfortunately, I will not be able to compliment uh, my colleague and father of the house in such flowing words as he used to uh, pay tribute to me this morning. <laughs> <coughs> it is most uh, reassuring to know that one has a colleague of such standing in the house here. <laughs> However, no doubt, uh, Time will come when opportunity will smile in my direction, with has interest, come, hopefully. Has come, has come. Uh, however, uh, I would like to compliment Deputy John Bruton on his elevation to the office of Taoiseach, and I wish him well. I'd like to let him know and let the House know that the stance that will be taken by the independents will be, will be an independent one, and we will vote on each issue on its own merits, and not because it is put forward by any particular party. I would also like to pay tribute to the opposition this morning. I don't know whether I should call them the opposition when they're over there or not, but the other members and parties in the House, and that is for the way they conducted themselves today. Because in the recent past, at least, uh, the incoming Taoiseach was uh, really gutted, metaphorically speaking. And it's good to see that that was not done today. Ahan, Ganarion Thalat. Minister of State and Government uh, Chief Whip, Deputy ask, Noel Dempsey. Ask him, Carla. I think I'm Government Chief Whip still, so I have just one, one item of housekeeping before I... Um, I just wanted to make clear with the uh, uh, Deputy Kenny that his proposal won't preclude uh, the House from deciding the terms of reference of the committee. <laughs> Uh, the Select Committee on Legislation and Security, that we can do that business afterwards if the Whips can agree, uh, just to have that agreement. So, um, uh, and uh, I, I would like on my own behalf, uh, Las Cairn Corla, and I'm sure on behalf of my colleagues in the constituency and on behalf of the people of the constituency of Meath, to offer my sincere congratulations to my constituency colleague, uh, Deputy John Bruton, on his elevation to the position of Taoiseach. <laughs> Uh, I want to wish him well on a personal basis. Um, I think uh, all of us that have had the experience of working with him uh, as members of this House, whether he was in opposition or we were in opposition down through the years, will uh, attest to his dedication and commitment to the constituency of Meath and to uh, the people of Meath, and I, I want to put that on the record. I also want to wish uh, Finola and his family uh, well. Um, and uh, I hope that however resolute we may be in opposition, and I can guarantee you that we will be resolute, that they will at least be spared fr uh, from the political fray in whatever we say or do, uh, because I think families suffer enough uh, during the course of political life. Uh, they should not be brought into this House uh, and should not be attacked in this House. Um, if I could, uh, just personally, John, uh, I want to wish you all the very, very best uh, on my own behalf and, as I say, on behalf of all of the people of County Meath. Thank you, Minister. Deputy Brian Fitzgerald. Thank you, Lashkin Corley. I, too, as a constituency colleague of John Bruton, to wish him the best of luck in a very, very difficult time. 
I've known you, John, for a long number of years, as my family has, and all of your family. <clears throat> Indeed, you mentioned earlier about 1969 when you first ran. I was working for two old stalwarts of Labour who have since left us, my late uncle and Jimmy Tully, who contested that election against you. You were successful and so was Jimmy Tully. Down through the years, I know that you have worked extremely hard. We've had many a battle, and indeed I'm sure we'll have many a battle again. But there is one point I will always, and I've always made, when I'm speaking to my colleagues or people from outside of County Mead, you are a man of utmost integrity and honesty. But then you could be nothing else, knowing the family that you have and you have been associated with down through the years. I think we will work together. I certainly will be striving very hard to ensure that the necessary improvements which you referred to in your speech there this morning will be brought about for the people that we all represent and indeed particularly the interest of peace in our country. I will give you my full support as indeed our party will over the next two and a half years. I wish you well, Fanula, who have I already spoken to today and the rest of your family. You've worked very hard for it and you have earned it. The very best of luck to you. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Colm Hillard. Uh, uh, I would like to sincerely congratulate John Bruton as a County Mead man and as a friend of mine and as a constituent of mine. <laughs> I, congr I congratulate I congratulate him I congratulate him on being elected the tenth Taoiseach of this country and um, I hope he will perform well and that's the country will benefit from his leadership. I know he has an important role to play and I wish him the very, very best. To his wife, Finula, and, the, uh, and their four children, I say that you'll probably see a lot less of him now that he has gone into this big job. <laughs> I have already spoken to the four children in the visitor, visitor's gallery and I have told them to tell their father that priority time each day for telephone calls is an essential. I will conclude by saying that and wish you health and good counsel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy. And perhaps perhaps our, our uh, Deputy Mary Wallace. Thank you, I have congratulated um, John Bruton um, myself, but I would like to publicly say to John that I am very pleased for him and for his family here today that he has been elected as Taoiseach. Um, 25 years ago when John came into the Dáil here from Dunboyne, I was at school in Dunboyne and I remember John Bruton being elected as a TD for the Dunboyne area and 12 years later I entered politics myself and in my 12 years um, in politics uh, coming from the same parish as John Bruton I must say that he has been more than courteous to me in my time certainly starting off 12 years ago and in all my time in politics and since I came in here to Dáil Éireann and I would like today to compliment John as my colleagues in the constituency have said on behalf of the people of County Mead it is a proud day for John Bruton and for his family. I would like to congratulate his wife Fanula and delighted to see uh, Fanula and the children here today and John's parents who I'm sure it's a proud day for them also to see him elected as Taoiseach. So on my own behalf and on behalf of the people that I represent in County Mead, uh, congratulations. Thank you, Deputy. And perhaps our final speaker on this matter of congratulations, Deputy Michael Ring. And let's Ken Kerler, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate John Bruton today. But I want to take in particular to congratulate his wife, Fanula, who happens to be from my town, Westport. <laughs> <laughs> and the people, the people of Westport. Westport. <laughs> 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 The people of Westport will be very proud and honoured today, as will Fanula's mother, Patsy, who I'm sure will be watching in this morning, and I know she will be very proud. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and let's take her. 
I want to say to the outgoing Taoiseach, I want to say to the outgoing Taoiseach, I want to wish him well, because his son also went to Westport to pick a woman. So we're, we're, we're used.